afternoon to cover the seminar. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our partners in crime, well not so crime, anyway, our partners in NCOM, um, Yusina Olko and John Sullivan from the University of Warsaw. Um, Yusina is very, very good at getting grants. If you're interested in Yeah. Golden <laughs> thumb. She's had a European Research Council starting grant, which are very sought after, um, and another big project from the Polish government on looking at well-being, a historical trauma, and, and language, language maintenance revitalization. Um, and the current grant, which we're currently working on, is called Engaged Humanities, and it's a collaborative project between ourselves, Warsaw, and the University of Leiden, which some of you would have heard us talking about a couple of months ago. So this is kind of complementary to that, to that talk. And they're going to talk, they're going to talk particularly, though, relating this to the work that we said we've been doing previously for the last 10 more years, going out to revitalization in Lava in Mexico, but also relating, I think, to the previous, your previous European Research Council project. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, well, thank you. Um, so the framework for this talk, uh, where this, the, the specific focus will be, especially in the end, toward the most recent experience of the field school, collaborative field school of the project Engage Humanities, which is carried out with SOAS, uh, with, uh, with, with Julian, with Peter, and with, um, with our Leiden partners. And uh, some people here uh, participated in this, in this event, uh, Evany, um, Albert, Joanna, uh, me, and John. Uh, so we hope this also can be some kind of exchange for uh, some kind of discussion we, that we can have about the, um, this recent experience. But I would like to start with the um, uh, framework uh, for this um, for this talk. Uh, as it actually uh, the activities I would like to reflect on are uh, developed um, within several major uh, team projects. Started uh, starting with endangered languages. Comprehensive Models for Recent Revitalization, uh, which was uh, funded by the Polish Ministry of Science, and it dealt with uh, the, um, the Nahuatl and the Nahuatl language, the Vemesiris language, and, and, and the Lemkal language in Poland. And then uh, this uh, huge project um, uh, that, that Julia mentioned, a uh, starting ground of the, of the ERC, Europe and American Contact, which actually ended this November. Uh, the last November, uh, but it has provided us with major funding and also opportunities to develop spaces for working with native speakers of Nahuatl as research partners. And then the current project, uh, Engage Humanities in Europe, Capacity Building for Participatory Research in Linguistic Cultural Heritage, this is the, the, this is the joint project with SOAS. And the new project, we just started uh, in December, Language as a Cure, Linguistic Vitality as a Tool for Psychological Well-Being, Health and Economic Sustainability, El Cure, funded, it's with European funding, but the, um, the agency which, uh, which um, is an, an intermediary in funding is Poli Foundation for Polish Science within TEAM program, and this is the project carried out with social psychologists and also psychiatrists. And uh, the institutional base is uh, the Faculty of Artes Liberales, University of Warsaw, where we recently created an international center, also with the participation of SOAS, called Center for Research and Practice in Cultural Continuity. And EDS, and John was going to, just to tell you about mm -hmm. EDS, because this is the institution he created. Okay. El Instituto de Docencia e Investigación Etnológica de Zacatecas, sorry. Um, is a nonprofit corporation in Mexico that cr we created in 2002. Um, I had been working with classical Nahuatl. I was in Zacatecas writing my, uh, my, writing my dissertation um, uh, on a, a topic related to classical Nahuatl, and I had, never, I had not learned modern Nahuatl. And I found there were native speakers at the university, so I started learning modern Nahuatl with them. Um, and, um, so I would be learning modern Nahuatl and then working with them in Spanish on translating documents that their ancestors had written in their own language. And I was, uh, I was then working for the university in Zacatecas and I, I was slowly realizing that one of the purposes of Mexican education, and not just Mexican education, but probably a lot of education, is ethnocide. You know? So I was sitting here working with native speakers of Nahuatl in Spanish on documents that their ancestors have written, written in their language, and I thought it was like getting a slap in the face. You can't do this anymore. Every, every moment you continue working with them in Spanish, 
you're contributing to erasing their language and culture. So from that moment, we began working monolingually. EDS became a monolingual space, a safe monolingual space for native speaking college students to continue practicing their language and their culture, working in teaching, research, and revitalization uh, activities. <clears throat> and um, there are a number of principles that have structured our work, but I will talk about those a little bit later. I just want to say something new in the development of EDS, which is for me very important. EDS was my brainchild, okay? So there's always the risk of me dominating this program, not being a native speaker, which is kind of strange. But the way things have happened, it has not developed that way, okay? The native speakers, through our teaching with, in different countries, have always participated independently in research projects with Western researchers all around the world. They've began their own research projects. They have worked with uh, researchers that have gotten grants in different countries, okay? Um, and the most recent thing that is happening is that I will be stepping down as director of EDS and the, the entire uh, directive and administrative structure of EDS will be, um, will be uh, uh, indigenous people uh, this, this year, okay. So, uh, so the, the basic um, the principles of our approach is that we work with community members and indigenous students um, in a collaborative ways and they are protagonists in research and other activities and also um, something that's very important, we have, we have become aware of this uh, internal colonialism in research, which is so, um, uh, I'm, I'm, my, my training is in ethno-history, and I worked uh, first with, on, on pre-Columbian Mexican and colonial period, and this is the area which really needs uh, decolonizing, not, also, not only in terms of research, but also uh, as far as scholars' minds are, are concerned, and this is one of the, of the things I've been reflecting on over the last several years, as an ethno-historian, how working with modern people and, and help um, collaborating uh, with them on promoting and um, reinforcing the use of, of, of native languages of Nahuatl can also be useful for the work, as, uh, for the work of ethno-historians, because for the indigenous pe people, past is part of the present. And I will talk about this, 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 this later. But it's also about how we make connections in the academy, with whom we work, how we work who become our partners, what are, what are the principles. There's a lot of internal colonialism here. So this is the area we would like to focus on today. This is a, this is a map which illustrates the development, or basically the, 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 the spread of Nawa, the, the, areas, the areas where Nawa was spoken across the centuries. So this big yellow, yellow area is the maximum extension of the language as the first language in the communities, but also as lingua franca. Uh, uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the 16th century and also in the moment of the, the first decades of colonization. And uh, the orange uh, are supposedly uh, now speaking populations, communities, of course, in areas which were uh, highly multilingual around 1521. And then um, current now populations, which are these red spots, these are not, uh, these are like isolated islands of speakers. And in most of these places, especially urbanized ones, the transmission has been broken over the last several decades. And a very brief overview of the history of Nahuatl. So uh, I'd like to just um, comment on several major, major steps of development. Uh, Nahuatl was probably one of the languages spoken in the empire of Teotihuacan in the first half of the first millennium AD. And then it was used in the Toltec state and as the language of Aztec, Altepet, or, or, or ethnic states between 13th and, and 16th century, and specifically as the language of the Aztec Empire, language of, administrat of, of administration also in dealing with external provinces, and it was used as lingua franca uh, in commercial uh, and political networks. And this role continued after the conquest because especially Spanish friars, but also administrators, decided to rely on Nahuatl uh, in their practical dealings uh, with a with um, very multi-ethnic uh, environment of Mesoamerica and a series of legal orders reinforced uh, along the 16th century uh, the, this, this, this role of Nahuatl, especially the famous order by the King Philip II in 1570, which announced Nahuatl to be the universal language of all the Indians. 
uh, promoting Nahuatl as the second language of the empire in the, I mean, in, in the area of New Spain, and all the Christianization and the doctrinal materials, and a lot of works, and um, also the, the, um, the spaces, the legal spaces were open for Nahuatl, and Nahuatl was, was used by indigenous people and also by other ethnic groups to, to, as an intermediary between native languages, other native languages, and Spanish. And this policy changed, um, the, the policy of the crown changed in the, in the end of the second half of the 18th century with the, the order um, uh, which actually um, prohibited, uh, royal order that pro prohibited in the 70, 1770 the usage of Nahuatl and promoting Spanish uh, language education, explicitly announcing the need of making local languages extinct. Uh, it was not really fulfilled, it was not implemented. The, the Spanish Empire disorganized, let's say, at this point was, was, very, um, um, was very weak. But the policy, uh, this policy was further continued with the Mexican independence as, as the part of the modernization of the, na of the nation. Indigenous groups had no real place. In, in, in the modern uh, Mexican uh, state, the category of India having special privileges, a social category with all its legal privileges uh, and uh, rights to communal and corporate uh, um, organization and land was abolished. So uh, indigenous people were practically left um, entirely undefended in the, in, in the modern, um, in the, fir the first century of the Mexican state which was um, followed by the policy which kind of was oscillating between assimilation and annihilation of, of, of indigenous groups and, um, and the policy of Hispanization and um, the bilingual education which finally followed uh, um, uh, in the second half of the 20th century was actually the way of very quick transitioning of native populations towards Spanish. and. Uh, at that time, we cannot talk about any form of stable bilingualism or, or multilingualism. This was, if there was a bilingualism in indigenous communities, it was a very uh, shortly, uh, short time bilingualism, which was a way of, of transitioning toward the dominant language. And this, this in many ways, this, 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 this policy continues today, despite the uh, existence of many institutions which uh, were created, like Inali, in order to support indigenous languages. Uh, would, we would like to turn to the, to the implementation of what we've been doing. So uh, as it started with EDIS, and John will comment on it, um, EDIS started to create monolingual spaces for research, teaching, uh, learning, and discussion in Nahuatl. Then our second step when we started to work together was to support Nahuatl literacy. And we started to organize capacity building and empowerment oriented activities. We started having this, 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 this support of, of within several grants, we started to carry out field work, but not, not we, but we encouraged um, indigenous students to carry out field work on their own, and we carried this field work together with them, or they, they did it on their own, they analyzed the results, and they used these results for their own uh, master thesis and their own research. And this, in the end, has led to creating spaces for developing indigenous methodology and collaborative research, and John will talk about this. And what we have seen in this work is that we shouldn't rely only on indigenous intellectuals, which is like the most obvious choice when you start to work and you want to, 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 to get people into, into research um, and um, natives, to, to work with native scholars, but in our activities we've, we've noticed that there are People who, who, really, who are really interested in getting involved in the long term are, are ordinary community members who already started to carry out activities in support of their languages, started teaching, but they are missing resources, preparation. Many of them are illiterate in Nahuatl because they, have, they, they, they didn't receive any, they hadn't received any um, formal education in, in writing their language. Uh, so being a, becoming aware of it, uh, has been very important and in our approach which is oriented toward boosting self-esteem empowerment and capacity building uh, for uh, for for native speakers not just intellectuals but also other community members who are willing to uh, to take some initiative john okay i just got to say something real quick what does it mean to be an indigenous intellectual 
the, the, the great majority of people that, that are indigenous intellectuals in Latin America are indigenous people. They speak their indigenous language, but they're intellectuals because they've been trained in Spanish in the university. They've gone up the system. They've become Hispanicized. All of their writing, all of their research is done in Spanish to a Spanish audience, Spanish speaking audience. So what does, indigen what does indigenous intellectual mean? What does that really mean? Um, if you don't have reading materials, okay, um, and you don't in Latin American indigenous languages, there's a dearth, a heavy, heavy dearth. If you don't have reference materials, a monolingual dictionary, a monolingual grammar, a monolingual encyclopedia, these are things we take for granted. If you don't have those, and they don't exist in America, okay, how can you set up an educational system or educational activities so that native, native speakers can do intellectual work with, from within their own language and culture? So the Totlahtol monolingual series that we've created through the University of Warsaw, it's not in Latin America, <laughs> University of Warsaw, nobody can believe this. We are the only people publishing in, in what is going to be hopefully a, a, a massive way monolingual materials written by native speakers across space and time. So we're going to start back in the 16th century. We already have. Oh, did, yeah. Yes. OK. With alphabetic, te alphabetic text written in Nahuatl by native speakers and publish that corpus all the way up till today. Not by steps, but you know, in all of them. Um, and an important part of this is orthographic standardization. It's a big political mess. OK. There's never going to be consensus for uh, um, an orthographic system in, in Nahuatl, in, in many indigenous languages in Latin America, because every linguist promotes his or her system. Every government agency promotes their system. And everybody fights with each other. It's a bunch of egos. So what we've decided to do okay, is take what, for us, is the most logical uh, uh, spelling system, which is based not on sound, because, I mean, think about it. If you wake up with a stomach ache, there's a good chance that you're going to pronounce something differently from when you don't have a stomach ache, and you're going to spell that word differently if you're trying to represent sounds. So what we try to do is represent morphemes. Okay? We try and, that is the element that crosses all variants in space and time in Nahuatl. And relying on the colonial tradition of writing, which is uh, <coughs> rejected um, based on ideological uh, arguments that it's a colonial heritage, right. but it's rejected by people who actually don't study this tradition, which was the tradition of writing not of Spaniards, but of indigenous people who used alphabetic writing in the colonial period as their, their own tools to defend themselves, to continue their culture, to win in courts over Spaniards to preserve their tradition. And, but also, we don't want to impose this but on we anyone. But we never impose anything. And for example, anything. in the field school, there were, there were students from, from uh, actually great initiative, uh, first uh, intercultural university that has classes in Nahuatl. We collaborate with the founders of this program, and they use different orthography. This is not a problem for us. We created even the, the field forms, the metada metadata forms, into variants. So if someone wanted to fill them in the standardized let's say, uh, modernized colonial orthography or the, the orthography they use in this university, they could choose, and there was no, absolutely mm -hmm. no, no problem with it, no fights right. over it. Right. Well, and we insist on not fighting, because, you know, fighting over anything is, is division. We want people to get together. It is in no one's best interest, except maybe the government's, for native speakers to be divided. People should be able to come together without barriers and talk about common problems uh, to share ideas for solutions. That's what we're trying to do. And promote. even for people who, 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 who use, normally use <coughs> different orthography, if they want to, to experiment, we encourage them to experiment, mm -hmm. to see how this would be, if they would like to, 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 to write something, do an experiment in this orthography, and if they like it or if they see an advantages. So it's like opening spaces for discussion, and, and uh, right. this is an experiment. Right. And these, uh, all of these works are available. The PDF forms are available for free. If any of you want access to the PDFs, you can contact us immediately. They're we'll, on our website. They, OK, they're on the website. Um, the but books are distributed free in indigenous communities. They're also being available, uh, becoming available slowly on Amazon.com for non-native speakers. 
but they're being used in a number of different situations. They're being used in the communities. People are reading them, but also, which is a pleasant surprise, um, they're doing group readings and discussions. Okay, which is very nice. And the authors and the members of EDS are actually mm -hmm. taking the, the, the doing this job on their own. They're going to the communities and and uh, all on their own initiative. Yeah. A reading, um, a reading with children, promoting, uh, working together, organizing mm -hmm. workshops with the use of this of these publications. Mm -hmm. So we just facilitate the the uh, uh, the fact that these books are available and they are being constantly published. Several new positions per year. But then the native speakers have to have to use them, and they, they've started to do that. And we found that now that researchers all around the world are starting to use our, our publications in their research, okay? And also, they're being used as teaching materials in classes for, for uh, uh, Nahuatl classes for non-native speakers. And just real quick before we finish this, I have to say that there's only been one monolingual dictionary two monolingual dictionaries of an American indigenous language ever written ever in history. The first one was written I don't, maybe 15 years ago in Guatemala. It's in a warehouse, not being circulated. Number two is our dictionary. It's called uh, it's the first one. 12,000 uh, 12, entries, monolingual contextual entries. Uh -huh. With references to colonial dictionaries of the Dr. Molina. And also Joanna, who is present here, is the author of two pictorial dictionaries. Uh, she, she developed with native speakers from, uh, from Huasteca and from Tlaxcala collaboratively and she illustrated these this, this dictionaries uh, and they are circulating. Yeah, and they are actually in the second picture, the children here have actually. Ah, yeah, sorry for moving so much. Yeah, this is the, the, the children are actually holding this picture, yes. dictionaries for La Huasteca. Mm -hmm. yeah. And two further projects that we're working on, starting to work on right now, we're doing a monolingual grammar of modern Huasteca Nahuatl is going to be a long-term project, big adventure. And also, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Florentine Codex, first encyclopedia uh, in America, probably published in America. In well, Mend is an European style encyclopedia, but resulted to be more like a mixture of uh, European style encyclopedia and native uh, compendium of knowledge mm -hmm. structured along traditional yep. Uh, discourses uh, by, 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 by native speakers who actually wrote it because Sagun was only the editor of this. Mm -hmm. And it's all in Nahuatl, 12 yep. books in Nahuatl, 16th century. And we're going to redo this in modern Nahuatl using all of the variants of Nahuatl. Um, people can contribute to entries in, on specific topics in their own variant and it will all be published online, uh, open access. And the, the main problem, the basic problem uh, we've encountered is Actually, the, the, the literacy in Nahuatl is very limited because Nahuatl speaking mm, yes. children, even if they are fluent speakers and the transmission is still in place, like these children from Soyatla in Puebla in the municipality of Tepehuma, they start their kinder with Spanish, entirely in Spanish, and continue with Spanish through whole, their whole life. So, so they don't develop any, um, uh, any school experience or, or um, more complex, let's say, cognitive experience outside their, their house and their, their experience with their families and, and the, the community at school related to their language. And they don't, they, they, they say they cannot read and write in Nahuatl. And when they come to this, the events, and this started in Cholula in 2014, they say, I can speak the language, I, but I cannot write it. I want to read, to, I, I want to read, I want to write, help me with that. So it's like the basic thing of, of teaching people how to read and write their language. And obviously, they can, they can learn it in a week or two weeks, as with this, this school group, which we included in one hour of our winter schools in Cholula, um, from Soyatla. They, they participated in the classes, in reading colonial documents, and modern uh, Wastek uh, Nawat class, and they, they, they learned to, to write and read with the standardized orthography, which was which easy for them because uh, it's based on Spanish orthography, and this is the, the orthography they, they, they knew from school. And in the end, and in the end, uh, uh, we organized uh, within the interdialectal interdialect uh, meeting encounter that John will talk about a literary competition for them. So they they the, these children, this teenager wrote poems and stories in Nahuatl in their variant, and then they were read aloud to the 70 native speakers from different re regions gathered there, and they voted for, uh, for the winners in the, in, the, in the literary competition. And um, it, was a, it was a very special experience. And then we, 
in, in posterior events, uh, people who, who, who came to participate, they said, look, I, I want to teach my language in the community. Nobody's teaching, but I don't, I don't know how to read and write. This is what I need to learn as soon as possible. So we realized that this is, this is something that um, is very important. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we've been doing this also as part of our um, other activities. And a special series of activities are connected to reading uh, historical texts in Nahuatl, written by the ancestors of the modern Nahuatl people in Nahuatl from 16th through 19th centuries. And we've organized a series of, of workshops. But the rule was that we don't use Spanish in, um, in these workshops. Everything is done in modern Nahuatl. Why? Why do we insist on that? Because this is one of the major obstacles, also psychological obstacles for the native people. You cannot use Nahuatl outside household because uh, it's, it's not proper. It's nobody would understand you. This is, this is like uh, entirely out of place. Y imagine having meeting of, uh, Nahuatl, of, of teachers of Nahuatl. Everything is done in Spanish. Okay, and, uh, and also this belief that people cannot communicate across variants, this John is going to talk about it. So we started this, uh, this, this, this workshops using modern variants of the language and reading colonial documents and discussing them and translating them in modern Nahuatl. And uh, for me, it's, um, as an ethno-historian, it has been particularly um, emotional because it's, it's reconnecting with the past, this part of of the heritage of history is not present at schools in Mexico. Indigenous children and also Mestizo children, they don't read Nahuatl documents that their, their ancestors uh, wrote. They don't know about many forms of agency and resilience across the colonial period. Colonial period is like dark ages. It's something that you don't talk about, you don't learn about very much. So there is no connection between the cultures of the past, the Aztecs, the Mayas, and the people today, the impoverished version of what it used to be. And this is actually part of the Mexican ideology from the 19th century. So great civilization, yes, and, but today's indigenous people, they, they, they have to be modernized and their languages are no longer reflection of these great languages of the past that or we used to, years. classical languages that, that, that used to be, uh, that, used, uh, that were used in, in, uh, before the Spaniards arrived. So by reading these documents, these this people actually realize they can understand them. Okay, they are so difficult, there are some hurdles. We have to, we have to struggle over certain, for example, syntactic expressions and, and some changes in the vocabulary, but they, find, uh, they can find out quickly, they understand that. And some loan words, which are not now stigmatized. As there are these arguments of pure that lang language is corrupt, it's not pure anymore. And they see this was, these loan words were already in the language in the 16th century, okay? So this is, there are several important messages for them. And also they can see different forms of agency. And then they can reflect upon these forms of agency and think how this can inspire their attitudes today. So this, this, these were the lessons from, from these meetings. And I would like to quote uh, <laughs> um, a testimony recorded after one of the, the first workshop actually by Jorge Hernandez from San Miguel Tenango. This is this Jorge who organized last year organized part of our field school in his community. And he started revitalization activities in his community, being a very successful young engineer in Mexico City. He doesn't need his language. He, he can speak English, okay? He, but he decided that he needs, he needs to do something for his community and for his language. And it, he evolved, I mean, his, his thinking evolved over the years, but started with a simple workshop. And he, this is what he said, but when we began to listen to the speech of our other brothers, people who come from many places, not just from here, if, what one calls Mexico City, they come from Veracruz, Oaxaca, Tlaxcala, then we understand each other. We began to understand each other and we began to examine the documents. So this, this, this bewilderment, this, this astonishment, we can understand each other, we can work together across variants. Mm, and, and I think, judging by his case, because he became an activist, uh, and he wants to continue, this has been like a source of, of, of inspiration. And also, uh, for me as a historian, this is important to, to work out ways, ways or approaches toward what, what can be called participatory, or already has been called by, by some historians, participatory historical culture, something which is relevant for the present. But to make it relevant for the present, it's very important to include people who are descendants of the people who wrote the document and see how this past can become part of, the, the, of their presence and, and the present time and what we can learn from them in understanding this past. 
and on different levels, even on the linguistic level, there are forms which appear in the, in the documents which can be connected to some, some forms of the spoken language today which otherwise would not be um, understandable. For example, a common, um, common greeting Piali in modern Huasteca Nahuatl that comes from Madios Mits, Mitzmo Piali, uh, may, the, may, the, may, may God um, guard you. Keep you. Yeah. Keep you, yeah which became abbreviated. So they discover these connections and it's, 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 it's really beautiful the experience to see how they, how they get reconnected to the past, which is so important for the indigenous um, identity. I'll show you just a short fragment of this, how it looks like. <laughs> People from all ages participating in that. So this is uh, this is um, also what uh, we've been doing with this publication. So this is one of the gatherings we filmed in uh, the houses, uh, one of the houses in the San Francisco Tetlanochan, when the author Refugio Navanava and our collaborator from Tlaxcala. Uh, read, uh, read, was reading his books to uh, the native speakers and they got involved in the discussion. They started to read uh, these books on their own, make, um, you know, uh, um, make jokes about it and, and it was, was really interesting uh, because this, this, this kind of literary orality is very important in storytelling but not in connection to, 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 to publish, to written, to printed, to printed works in the language. John. Okay. Um. First, I think we need, well, okay, I want to talk about indigenous methodology, and people are starting to write about that now. Um, but I think we need to ask ourselves a question first. Why is indigenous methodology, research methodology, important? Why is revitalization of language and culture important? Why is linguistic and cultural plurality important? Well, for me, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. You know, as, hum as human beings, we have a lot of problems a lot of shared problems all over the globe. And if you want to solve a problem, you don't take 100 clones of the same brain, of the same education, of the same language, and set them to work on that problem. You want 100 different languages, 100 different perspectives, 100 different sets of cognitive and, and effective tools that are offered by, uniquely by different languages and cultures, working simultaneously on those problems and looking for ways to enrich our lives collectively, right? So it's not, some, it's not just for the good of the community, it's for the good of all, all humanity. Uh, okay, um, <clears throat> I, a couple of things came together um, and had us, had us start reflecting specifically on methodology, uh, research methodology. First, we published the dictionary after, it was a 15-year project. Um, um, and, uh, and then uh, two of my students uh, finished their master's degree with, a the with theses written in Nahuatl, okay? Uh, and, and then I, I, I've read a little bit of what's been published, very little bit of what, what's been published on indigenous methodology. And I haven't liked it. Why? Because there's basically three topics <laughs> when, you, when you read about indigenous methodology. Number one, people theorize about indigenous methodology. People talk a lot about politics. 
and they criticize Western methodology. So it's like dancing around the subject. They're not actually doing the research or exploring ways to actually do research on specific projects from an indigenous perspective, from within an indigenous language. And it occurred to me, well, geez, that's what we've been doing at EDIUS for the last 20 years. <laughs> so it's probably time to start thinking about it, think about what we've done. So a couple of things jump out. Um, you know, we work monolingually, and it's really important. You know, and, and, and I just said, you know, a specific language and culture gives you a specific set of tools to work upon reality, to perceive reality, to transform reality. That's good for everyone. Um, and a lot of people throw a criticism at us and say, well, you're purist. You only want to work monolingually. No, that's not the case. We want our students to be able to work with many languages, obviously. But the problem is, you have these kids coming from these villages where they were raised monolingually in Nahuatl, and then they go to school. And a lot of them, I would just have to say, were tortured. Some with physical punishment, fines, um, 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 psychological, everything you can imagine. And then you go out in the, in the culture and you, I mean, out in the society, in mestizo society, when, when they go outside of their, their village, and there's all this you know, racism and discrimination. So when they get to EDIUS as college students, they've pretty much decided that they're never going to speak their language or practice their culture again, except when they go home to visit. And then they run into us. And it's like we have to jumpstart them. You know, like you jumpstart a battery that's dead? We have to jumpstart them back into using their language to think critically and creatively. And the dictionary has been a really good tool for that. Okay, we didn't intend it to be, but it is. Think about it. Constructing a definition for a word. And not a calc. Not using the structure of an English or a Spanish definition of a word, but thinking how you, from within your language and your culture, how do you define a word? Okay? And creating example sentences for every definition, for example. This has allowed the native speakers at EDIUS to get back into using their, their language, well, they've never used their language academically, but getting into their, using their language academically. Um, epistemology. That's a big word. <laughs> you take classes on it. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the kids at EDIUS, They've gone through, they're Nahuas. They've been raised in, within their culture, in their language, and then it starts to mix with Spanish. And so they don't know what's what, you know? And if you're going to really work within your language, you have to start exploring how your language structures your perception of reality and how you work with reality. Okay? And you have to be able to divide, at least for the moment, what's yours and what's the outside. Okay? So there's just some really quick examples, super, super quick examples. You know, a conference we went to where we had some native speakers of, I think it was Wiradica, talking about colors. And they were talking about colors in their language. And I raised my hand after, the, after their talk and I said, well, in Nahuatl, you know, you don't really have the concept of colors. Okay, the concept is the surface appearance of something. So within this big box of surface appearance, you have what some people would call colors, but you have, for example, fuzziness, bumpiness if you can see it, softness. It's surface appearance, okay? And they said, oh my God, you're right, we do that too. So if you don't go down to the level of basic perception and the basic construction of the language, how the language is put together, you can't start to rediscover how you work at the most basic academic level, okay? And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to do at EDIUS. Another thing which is really important <clears throat> is this idea of, and you guys probably debate this all the time, this idea of how we, how we look at reality in Western society. Well, we compartmentalize everything. 
we cut up everything into these little compartments that are self, uh, um, self-contained, okay? And so you can study religion without having to study economy or the relations between religion and economy or vice versa. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, we, all, all of our universities and schools are divided up into disciplines, okay? And we take it for granted. No indigenous person on earth is gonna, unless, they, unless they, it's been beaten into their head through their education, they would never under, they, accept that this is even possible. Everything for indigenous people is interconnected. And there's nothing you can talk about without including deities, natural deities, for example. Okay? And another real quick anecdote that would, that would uh, describe this is one of our students, Eduardo, who just got his master's degree and wrote his thesis, he's writing on corn. So the, 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 me, the advisor, the gringo, says, okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to ta- have a chapter talking about deities, chapter talking about land. This is the book, the, 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 the yeah. dissertation that John refers to. A chapter talking about maybe tools, chapter talking about agricultural cycles, and he's, he just says, no, it, it, this just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't work for me. So what he came up with, okay, is talking about the agricultural cycles, but as ceremonies during the year. And then within each ceremony are articulated deities, tools, land, (laughs) techniques, okay? Yeah, okay, so these are the, and and if, if the, if, okay, and that, I will be real quick. The Mexican school system, as a lot of school systems, does not promote independent thinking. So another thing that's really important at EDS is giving the kids permission to think for themselves and giving them activities where they're forced to think for themselves with their buddies, okay? And when they, when they do this, then the, all of these beautiful things start coming out, okay? Because they have permission to do it, they realize they can do it, and now they have, they're starting to access all of this richness which comes from within their own language and culture. Good. And I would only like to add that uh, we had so far two master tests defenses entirely in Nawa with committees, uh, not only by native speakers but also Koyomer uh, foreigners speaking the language, um, including, including uh, um, Professor Flores Farfan uh, and um, Adam Kuhn, uh, who also was in uh, Tlaxcala with us, and me uh, online. Everything was done in Nawa, all the whole defense, and the community members participated, the families which came. For the, for, the, for, the, for the event, and they, they, they were in the university space, and the thesis were written and published in NAWA. And uh, so, summing up this part, what can empowerment lead to? So, we, we, we hope that uh, these this joint activities carried out in the native language uh, can um, encourage developing agency and fostering new social linguistic environments, committees specific for language revival and use, and the, 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 the students at EDS already started doing this work for their communities in the Huasteca in, and they took initiative in their own hands and um, this is like a separate, a separate, separate topic of what they started to do in the communities. Uh, and, uh, but what's also important from, from our perspective is that new networks appear between native speakers, new speakers of the language and external speakers, so, so, so people like, like, like me, like, like other students and researchers all over the world who learn to speak the language and, and work in the language with them. And uh, I think this, this, is, this is also very, very, very positive uh, to, in boosting self-esteem and different initiatives of, of native speakers. But then there is this very difficult step of taking the risk to go against or question existing ideologies, attitudes, and power relationships in the, in the community. And uh, those of us who, who, who went to the field school in, in Shaltipan could, could see how, how it is. Uh, and I will come back to, to this issue. Uh, it's not very easy to become a revitalizer of the language when language property, language ownership uh, is so important, although it's not explicitly pronounced in the community when people do not want to risk their established positions as a professor, teacher, or specialist with uh, being accused of, uh, of using the language for his personal advancement or his personal career or his personal gain. This is very, very complicated, and only few people can do it, and we're we becoming aware of this, how actually difficult it is to do, 
to start something in the communities, not just between the communities and in the events or promoting the, uh, the Nahuatl language in, the, in social networks. This is one thing, but really doing something in the community and going against dominant ideologies is, um, is, is a very huge challenge. And uh, this the last event, uh, uh, the last part of the talk we, we, on which we would like to comment briefly is this, uh, this, this field school. Uh, in San Miguel Chaltipa and another community in Tlaxcala, which was organized as part of our capacity building activities. I have to tell you in the beginning that the, 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 the program officially is for uh, people from, from our university to undergo capacity building and, and learn from, 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 from our partners, from partners at SOAS and Leiden, but we've negotiated with the European Commission to be able to fund the participation of ethnic minorities. And, and, without a definition, so this, that they don't have to have a legal status of the minority. Everybody whom we consider to be <laughs> a minority is, is participating, is being funded. So the idea of this field school was not to carry out a training for Western students, because we have plenty of opportunities for this kind of training in, in, in Europe. This was something we wanted to organize for native participants and students as much as possible in all language so that they can see that, that, that we don't have to use dominant languages to carry out these activities, but also to show Western students how this kind of field work carried out entirely in the native languages without using the dominant language, also by external students who learn the language. So this was something we wanted to share. And we are really lucky because there were many students, also former students of John, yeah or indigenous researchers from US, for example, but also from Europe who could speak modern Nahuatl, and they even presented research papers, conference papers in Nahuatl uh, to, 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 to the native audience about their research. They, they did it in the modern language. So I think the impact of this for, for the people, for, 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 for native speakers who gathered from all over the Mexico, different regions, I think that this was the impact we, we wanted to have to make them feel more confident that they can use their language in public spaces, in education, yeah. they can deliver papers about their research, they can talk about their problems and their activities, they can plan together, they communicate. And people who would never admit they are speakers of the language, from the community, which sort of banned use of the language, they would make, they would reveal themselves. They are perfect speakers of the language, nobody suspected. Like the, the, the waiter who was serving food, he, he got so encouraged, nobody knew he, he spoke the language including Beatrice she, she, and, and Refugio, they didn't know he yeah. spoke the language, and he, it turned out he speaks the language, and he was very happy to communicate. So this was something we, 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 were, we were looking for. So these are the uh, participants uh, from, from all over the world, uh, from our three universities in, in, in Europe, but also from, from ethnic minorities in Europe, and, from people, uh, and people from the United States, and we wanted to bring indigenous researchers, activists, and artists speaking Nahuatl and other indigenous languages. Uh, so we have speakers of, of, of Ayuk, and spe speakers of, of, of Mishtek here, and speakers of Nahuatl together. And uh, minor speakers from Europe and Mexico who are, who are, who are sharing their experience, like Justyna Majerska sitting there, and then Temateusz Kruz, revitalizers of the Vimesieris language. And we, we were talking about the series in Nahuatl. I was translating from, from, from Polish to Nahuatl. Uh, and we had several working groups focusing on documentation of linguistic cultural heritage of, of different places, different communities participating. There was a group working on language attitudes and language planning, group uh, working on preparation of teaching materials, group on artistic activities, and a group which worked on local concepts of well-being and, and development based in, in, in the heritage. And uh, we carried out um, different activities and also field work. We will see some of it in the, uh, in the movie. Uh, the, the, the composition of the groups was, uh, was, um, was uh, planned so that there would be at least one or two native speakers or speakers of Nahuatl in each group, which could uh, help with uh, translation and also carrying out documentation and interviews with uh, native speakers in Nahuatl. Um, uh, there was this cultural event in San Miguel Tenango, which is a, a kind of peripheral community in the mountains, uh, speaking the language, and it was entirely organized by our former, by, Ho, by, by Jorge Hernandez Marquez, who started, who, who actually found us in Mexico City when we were organizing the workshop the, 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 in, the, in the archive, and then got interested into, into, into promoting his language. And also we worked with, uh, with um, different organizations in uh, San Francisco, Tetlanojka. This is the community where maybe one third of the population migrated to the United States. 
and we had performances by indigenous participants and we tried also to promote reading and, and the publications in Nawaf. And the last thing we would like to comment about before finishing is, uh, is uh, our interdialectical encounters because this was also the two days of our uh, field school were, uh, were, were devoted to interdialectical encounter in Nawaf. Yeah. And John will comment on this aspect yeah. of, of the one of the One of the um, tools for dividing indigenous people in Mexico is this argument that you have di a lot of different variants of these different languages and the variants are mutually unintelligible, okay? And this is even supported by a lot of a lot of scholars. So in 2011, Stephanie Wood from the University of Oregon got a, a, uh, a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and uh, we at EDS were working with her. And we decided to do this interdialectical encounter. Okay, we invited speakers of representing approximately 10 different variants of Nahuatl, about 20 people, um, and we met for five days. And there were only two rules: you have to speak in Nahuatl. No fighting, <laughs> even if we're talking about orthography, okay? So we did, and nobody knew what would happen. And we were pleasantly surprised to find that everybody understood each other. Obviously, you know, people would hear something, they'd laugh and say, oh, we don't say that, you know, what does this mean? I say it like this, but everybody understood each other. So we had five days of talks on every different topic you can imagine, and this is really important too. Whenever native speakers get together in Mexico, normally it's at the behest of, a, of, of an institution, a Mexican institution. The talks are in Spanish and the topics are organized previous to the, the conference. So we always organize our topics at the conference when it begins so everybody can talk about what they want to talk about. And that's what we did. We also um, had found out earlier that, surprise, surprise, when we have mixed groups of men and women, a lot of times the women will defer to the men, okay? So we always, in our interdialectical encounters, we have at least one session where women have their own space, space to talk and the men are in a, in a different space. So anyway, um, we have progressed slowly from completely open topics along the course of these interdialectical encounters that we've had to focusing on specific things. Justina spoke about the, uh, the activity we had at the uh, Archivo General de la Nación. First time indigenous scholars or even indigenous people enter the National Archives in Mexico and first time they ever actually look at the documents that were written by their ancestors and analyze them in their own language, okay? Um, and then finally, um, this, uh, the, the last one we had in San Miguel Chatipa, Okay. But, but no, no, not the last. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in San Miguel Chantipa, yeah. um, where it was an academic conference. It was a conference, and you have these kids. When I say kids, I'm talking about as young as student teachers who are who are going to become bilingual educators in Mexico of indigenous languages, up through. I, Natalia is how old? Sixty something. Sixty something. <laughs> we always have a big spread. Okay. Everybody talking about what they're doing, whether it be curriculum development, projects for their school, book projects they're working on, multimedia presentations. Dictionaries. Uh, dictionary, dictionaries, book presentations, everything you can imagine. Everybody speaking in Nahuatl, and they're so happy to be doing this, and not only that, but to get feedback from their peers. Okay, and the last step, or the next step, which we still haven't gotten off the ground, is to conduct these virtually so that we don't have to wait a year between each interdialectical encounter. Okay, summing up, and we, we, we are done. Yes, yes. So uh, we have some mm -hmm. other thoughts, and uh, uh, this, this field school actually um, was, was very intense, and uh, um, I have the feeling that we, we've, we've been able to get our understanding much deeper of language ideology, attitudes, and, and the local politics in the community, especially in San Miguel Chaltipan. It's a bit overwhelming and not um, that's in the sense of uh, issues that we have not been aware before, language ownership, what are local ideas of revitalization actually sometimes reduced to post-vernacular <coughs> use of the language. And also what we, what we found out, which is was a challenge for, for, for future work, is denial of shift and language death as well as of its reasons. 
but also weakening, uh, still present, but weakening of attitudes linked to language purism. Uh, so, so people who, who speak or semi-speakers um, are seen as the hope of the of the future of Nahuatl and the language is safe because we have these people, okay? And so, so, so there's no concern. Uh, also, local competition between communities and internal racism. We have a very, very, very um, difficult episode of, 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 of internal racism between the communities. It was a very, very difficult thing uh, during the field school, uh, which also so was a huge, huge lesson um, for, for all of us and for our sensibility and, and, and awareness. So, the huge challenge that we see for us and, and, and other people is creating new role models in the communities where there is no revitalization maintenance and, and kind of challenging existing ideologies and trends and politics in the communities. And one of the, day, of the ways we can help with this is connecting activists uh, from the Nava world and beyond and creating this, this, this community of practice which is actually outside a specific community. And, and what will they will do with that in their communities is, is kind of beyond us. But by creating this community of practice, is, is, is this kind of support we, we, can, we can provide as external people, as scholars, as academics, as activists. And this is um, something that actually uh, is already happening. Uh, thank you for your attention. And before questions, we'll show you a, a short documentary about the, the field school. Gracias. 
Maka moto tenan cintech mitawi Timo tlankwa koloa nispan cinco Tonan cinayitech mo makakawi but you can talk about uh, yeah, um, I mean we had to uh, just a specific example um, in our monolingual dictionary of Nahuatl a lot of the words are of Spanish origin okay and we had to decide which ones to include and which ones to not include and so it's really it's not really that difficult because we applied a series of criteria um, for example um, are the words that are that are incorporated and they're usually all nouns okay um, can they co be compounded or incorporated onto now what uh, um, you know verbs and nouns? Can they be inflected? Are they substitutive borrowings? 
Also. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh huh. And so and and uh, and so that that's one of the things we do. But basically, when we you, how can I see? How can I say this? In, in the publications that we've done so far, okay, um, you don't have the the. the we haven't seen a massive, massive amount of substitutive borrowing, like you say. But okay. we have it in our field materials, of course. Oh, yeah, of course. But those mm -hmm. are recordings. Yeah, uh, and the idea is that um, we, 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 in the case of Nawat Purins, is obviously uh, is um, counterproductive. It actually uh, stops speakers who are stigmatized for their mm -hmm. um, loan wars. Including elder speaker in the community, and we we work with communities like that, like for example Tlacotenco in uh, in Estado de México. It's counterproductive. It actually hinders from using the language. Mm -hmm. And we got into discussions with them with them because they came to to, to AGN to the workshop and said, "Look, you are reading this this polluted uh, document. There are plenty of loan words. We speak better now at." That these people in the 16th century. But then we visited the community, we had this discussion in Nahuatl about that. We continued talking uh, to them about that. The idea is that what we want to show, and also as a result, one of the results of the ERC project on language change, five centuries of language change, is that loanwords have been, some loanwords have been in the language right from the first decades of the contact. And they got assimilated and so on. So we don't really. Um, uh, when, when we publish, we don't uh, make the native speakers get rid of these loanwords, okay? But also we want to make them aware of the fact that some loanwords are now in the modern uh, state of the language change are substitutive and lead to, to this, this extreme code mixing. So when we work with them, and for example using older texts or some literary texts, they can actually get into, into touch with this, this vocabulary which is, which is, which is vanishing these lexical resources which can be re, re, um, reintroduced into the language. John has experimented a lot on uh, creating neologisms for uh, academic purposes, creating from within the language, not calcs from, from Spanish. Uh, so so, so I, I would say it's complex. So we, we don't kind of um, create like negative comments for using Spanish loan words. But we also encourage native speakers to experiment with uh, with uh, with the new words or getting to all the resources how they can be how they can be explored and used in, in, in modern variants of the language. So this, there's no easy solution in one recipe mm -hmm. here, right? Yeah, I, I'd like to say, say one more thing. Um, you know, since we do work simultaneously with older and modern Nahuatl, okay, um, it has been very easy to see, okay. And, and again, this is really important for linguistics because if you only focus on one variant in time, there's a lot of things you're not going to be able to understand because you don't know where they came from. And vice versa, if you're looking at the past, you don't, may not understand how something works unless you've seen how it, how it develops, even internally in the language over time. But for example, there are a lot of uh, structural changes that have been going on in Nahuatl over the last you know, 450 years. Okay? The majority of them today are still at a point of transition. A flux. Okay? flux. So you can work with native speakers and you can say, okay, you guys are doing this, but how would your grandparents have said it? Oh, they say this. Okay, so that's how it was originally. This is how it's been transformed because of the contact with Spanish. And we want people to understand how their language works and how it's developed. We don't want to tell them what to do. And also people who, who are engaged in field work, for example, who are semi-speakers, who are passive speakers. We, we have some collaborators who are passive speakers, understand perfectly different variants, but were not able to speak, started to speak. And then when they, 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 they were sharing this experience with us, okay, so we, 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 trans, we translated, transcribed, and translated this and this and that from different regions. Oh, we learned so much in terms of vocabulary and terms. It's so useful. And um, so there are different, different, different ways, but one of the things we wanted to, students to make aware, students of uh, indigenous students, that um, th there are certain borrowings which are substitutive borrowings, actually, and there, there are lexical resources they can resort to, and, the, and dictionary is, 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 is very helpful in this, in the, in this respect, actually, to, to, to avoid too, um, too much substitutive borrowing in the language. But no policy, like strict policy and like, like no. I, I want to say one more thing, real quickly, about the, the importance. <laughs> real quickly is the word. 
<laughs> Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead. Um, can I ask you a nasty question? Of course. If you, you have to. What you shared with us is wonderful, and the result of 20 years of commitment. In my case, it's not 20 years, but well, thank you. <laughs> in John's case, in John's case I mean, Okay. Whatever it is, ten joint, to joint experience of 20 years. No, 10 to 20 years of whatever of, in, of engagement and involvement, and with, with you know, very interesting and very powerful results. In the modern university situation, for the students who are here, you cannot get funding for projects that go for 20 years. You can get short term money, you work a, work a project for two, three, four years, and then you're supposed to move on, do something else, do another project, do whatever. How can you sustain this kind of activity in, in that sort of environment? Mm -hmm. This is what we've been struggling with. So the, 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 we, uh, we are not, our activities are not shaped by the framework of funding, but we shape the framework of funding, and we negotiate the framework of funding so that we can, so imagine having ENCOM, which is for capacity building of us in Warsaw. But we've been using this also for our learning from the minorities and experience of different activists and communities, but also getting the opportunity of the communities to, to learn something. So I think it's having this flexible and open mind, a flexible attitude toward negotiating the conditions of your work, I think, and all fun and funding. And, and then it turns out it, it is flexible. If you start to negotiate it, you can, you can use the, the, the resources you have to do what you want, after all. So this has been my, my, my idea behind that. And there were so many different projects, but in each of the projects, even project for the development of the national heritage in Poland, I've been able to include Nawal. Okay, and this was the first project uh, focusing on revitalization, and uh, we included Vimesieris, this is how, how I got into touch with Vimesieris and Wemko, but you know, my, my, my why, why I did it was, was kind of opportunistic in, this, in a way, because I wanted to, f to find money for Nawat. So I started to look for, for, I wasn't interested really in Polish minorities. I got interested after that. But I needed some you know, Polish groups to step in in order so that I could get funding for Nawat, because there was funding available. And maybe it was not very noble uh, approach, <laughs> but in the end I gained a lot because I really uh, got involved into, into Polish reality. And, and, and I, I realized that there is so much to be done, and it's not so much different from what's going on in Mexico. Yeah, so we I, are all uh, learning all the time. Yeah, why, why do you think we found it needless in the first place? How do you get around funding restrictions that are also tied to political commitments as a part of the, the system? And how do you get around the structure of academia, which a lot of times doesn't, you don't really have academic freedom, okay? That's why we found it devious in the first place, okay? The idea was to have a nonprofit very close to the university, okay, which would allow us a space where we could decide what we want to do, how we consider it to be done correctly, and generate independent funding, okay? And that's what we've, that's, that's, so that's what we've been doing. Okay, I understand exactly what you're saying, okay? I understand exactly what you're saying, and it's really difficult, okay? It's really difficult. But, I mean, in the last instance, what do you gotta do? You gotta take up your hammer, and you gotta start whacking away at the wall. <laughs> You'll get someplace, and it's gonna be hard, and most people are gonna not, not gonna wanna do it, because it's too difficult. And the practical solution that actually John implemented, because you, you have students who, have to, who write their PhD dissertation, they have three, four, maximum five years, okay? And Two and a half years in Mexico. Yeah, but for example in the United States. And so the expectation is they should learn the language, learn in the language with the communities. How can they do it? In the case of NAWA, thanks to the program that, that was, was, was organized by EDS, this intensive uh, summer course, they actually can start communicating after the first, the first course and they continue with classes online. So basically students in the United States and everybody who wants to take the course in one year can can, uh, can speak Nahuatl and can go to the communities and do field work and co can collaborate with native speakers. So, so, so EDS has created this, this infrastructure, academic infrastructure. If someone really wants to do the, the field work, wants to work in the language, in one year he can speak the language. So this can also be done with other languages, not just for, 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 for Nahuatl. Can I give one example real quick? Do we have any time at all? No. Yes, we do. It's, 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 it's 1655. Yes, but we need to get out at five to allow 10 minutes change. 
okay, okay, all right. Yeah. You okay, show this okay. in whatever you need to show, you show it in the pub. In the pub, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the